Um, I was I was writing short stories um, in the early days, but didn't very, feel very confident publishing them. And I don't think they were publishable at that point. It was sort of because it's a difficult form to master. So it took a while before I felt that some were up to scratch. And even then, you do make quite a ruthless cut for a collection. But there is something about the form. I think it improves my writing. I think um, those structures that you end up using, even if it's just a sense of a shape when you're beginning to write, are very good for me as a writer. Um, and they sort of bring me into uh, new territory in a way. Novels allow you to be very kind of baggy and sloppy and you can fix things in the edit. And um, I've always felt that uh, perhaps there was something, I required something shorter. Lots of my novels are made up of small sections. Even if they're not demarcated small sections, they are, you can feel a kind of natural pause at the end of a thousand words. Or, um, and that's the way I, I write the long form too, um, quite episodically. And I think, you know, if you, you sort of separate them out and what you, what you have as a sort of shorter form. And, and I love that. I think um, there is something really suitable for me and my work about the short story form. It allows you to explore disquiet and um, territory that is very unsettling to a reader, which I do in my novels as well, I think. Uh, but again, the short story form is, is really the form that allows you to, to go to those very, very dark places. There is, there is a sense of, of a sort of how gratuitous can you be and what new and, and disturbing territory uh, are you able to come across as a writer. And I wonder if that's just a sort of salacious aspect or, or, or you know, there'll be a scene. People talk about the scenes in American Psycho. You know, they're kind of these famous, horrible scenes that you, they're almost too horrible to conceive and, and who can outdo that. And that's just, one, that's just one way of thinking about writing. But if you look at the work of... Um, uh, Cormac McCarthy um, writing something like Blood Meridian, which is one of the, the truly the most blood curdling books I've ever read. The end of it is abs I had to sleep with the lights on after finishing the book, and I never have to do that. I'm fairly, I'm, with fiction anyway, I'm very, very, uh, I have a very you know, strong constitution. Or somebody like Hilary Mantel, I think, also ha has those qualities of um, just phrases, actually, phrases which really sort of like punch you in the gut. Mm. Incredibly strong-armed writer. Um, and I think that's, that's far more interesting territory. That's powerful writing as opposed to just uh, disturbing and violent writing. Mm. And it's there for a reason. It's exploring something about human beings. It's taking you to one side of the spectrum, um, which we're all on. I mean, we're all capable of, of certain minor atrocities, probably, and... Uh, even exploring those minor atrocities can be quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very strict cut, I think. You're looking for something that, um, as, a, as a, a textual journey, works very well. So you're taking the reader through an experience and not... High drama doesn't have to happen in a short story, but I think it... On the, on the surface level, something needs to be going on, but actually with the short story, it's what's going on underneath and above and the hinterland around it that you're aiming for something quite ambitious in that regard. Mm. So as a piece of prose, you know, they move the good ones move fairly briskly and it's about brevity of language and what's alluded to and the idea of referred pain instead of a long description necessarily about the subject or the episode that you're writing about. Um, but I think good short stories ask for a sort of philosophical understanding about literature and the greatest short stories have a metaphysical quality so that you you know you you really feel reverberations from it moving out and out and out and those reading experiences are extraordinary you come away never being able to forget a great short story um, and it's a different kind of literary journey uh, from long fiction it's, it's a it's a great ambition for writers to have to be able to crack the short story I think It's probably the sense of wanting to make an inquiry into a subject. So um, the, the four novels that I've written, and I'm about to finish my fifth, have all been governed by an idea, really, before character, probably even before place, although I very quickly get a sense of the place that um, 
the book's going to be set in. But it's, it's, always, it's always an idea, a fascination, whether that's tattooing and the history of tattooing, body art, why do people feel compelled to symbolise their lives on their, on, their, on their bodies? It's incredible. So the Electric Michelangelo was an inquiry into tattooing and it took in the seaside industries in, in their kind of fall and decline in the UK and in America and various other things, you know, politics swirling around it. But that was the driving interest for me. Um, the novel that I'm writing now is about, it imagines a reintroduction of grey wolves to Britain because I'm interested in apex predators and the idea of a healthy environment. What do we do with any wilderness that we might have or might be able to recreate in Britain? There's not much of it left, but... Um, how does, how does the nation feel about that? On the one hand, it would create a healthier countryside, uh, but, you know, sheep farming, you know, these things are at odds. So that's, that's re it's the interest. Um, and, and I think those kind of interests are complicated and they, requ they do require a lot of space, so they, they need to be set into the, into the longer form. Whereas the short story, I just have a sense of a sense of an incident that might be occurring or a kind of character interaction or just a scenario that seems like a motif for something much, much bigger. So I'm very happy to kind of create, try and, you know, bring the world down to a pinhead, essentially. But within that, you know, there's, there's, there's enough, there's enough satisfaction from that piece. Um, but it's usually, it's usually more of an, an a kind of an aloof, oh, I don't know how to describe it really. Not, not a thorough examination, but a, just a sense that something that might happen might mean something very important somehow. Yeah. Sometimes you hear an incredibly articulate writer who perhaps the work doesn't seem actually as, as complicated and sophisticated and hasn't quite got the, the radiance or the authenticity or the, the brilliance. and. Often, you know, a writer can't talk about their work very well and, and yeah. or doesn't want to, sort of resistant of interpreting it for the reader, which I always really respect. I mean, that can be seen as belligerence or standoffishness or snobbery or just something or an, un an unwillingness to engage in the mechanism that we have now, which wants to know about writing and how things are done. Um, and often those are the writers, the ones that are have a strange articulacy or, or a kind of a, an eccentric quality. They're the ones that I think can produce great literature, not that those characteristics are necessarily inherent for a great writer, um, but it is strange. Sometimes the most articulate analysis, self-analysis of work uh, happens from writers who I think the, the work is, is not magnificent and, and vice versa. Um, but I do love hearing writers talk about their work because I always feel like I, I can't quite... I can't quite do it with myself. I can't quite nail what I mean. And if you if you do hear somebody talking brilliantly about literature generally, not just their own work, I'm always slightly in awe of that. And it's wonderful to hear it because you think that's what I meant. Like when you read a great book, you think, yes, that's life. That's like life. It's wonderful to hear someone else articulating it for you. And often I don't feel like I truly know a character either. And I think that's fine because in life you, you may think you know people very well, but actually they always have the capacity to surprise or upset you. Or, you know, there is that room for, for kind of strange development and, and surprise. So there are, and the more, I think the more, the more I have a preconceived notion about who a person is, the less likely an interesting character will be formed on the page for me. Um, so there are aspects which, again, I'm interested in. If a person who is slightly like this was put into this scenario, what might happen? And it's, it's almost like experimental chemistry that way. And I'm far more interested in that as a writer than just, I know this, this, this character and they're like this and they're going to do that and they move over to here. Some writers have to work with a plan um, and it works very well for them. But I'm just not able to do that. As a reading experience, I always enjoy just being lost in the world, and the world is real and whole and seamless to be convinced by it. And I was like that as a kid as well. I very quickly gave up on books if, if I didn't believe everything. Um, I have since then come to love literature where um, there's 
you know, the plumbing's, the plumbing's on the outside, it can work very well, particularly if it relates to the content somehow, this form's being used, this structure's being used for a particular reason to suit the subject matter or the drama or whatever's being developed. Something like um, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia by um, Mohsin Hamid, it's, um, it's great, it sort of comes as a self-help book, so the address is in the second person, which is wonderful, you know, it's sort of uh, how you are going to make your fortune, um, and the structure of the self-help book is left in, so each, each chapter begins with a sort of an introduction from the, narrat the narrator uh, of, of, of how, how this can be achieved, and then it morphs into the story of the character of well, you, essentially. Um, and it's wonderful, it works really well. It's almost, you couldn't imagine another way that that book could be put forward. Mm. Its structure is, needs to be on display completely. Um, so something like that, absolutely yeah. fantastic. And it's, or whether it's um, Schroeder that's made it, Amity Gage made it onto the shortlist of, of the folio. Um, and it's um, a document that's being written, it's a letter of confession really, written to an ex-wife by a character in prison. He's in prison for abducting his daughter. And you find that out quickly. So, you know, there it is. That's everything. That sort of tells you the end of the story as well, in a way. But because the voice is so compelling and this character is so complicated and charming, but you know he's obviously acted out of turn, it sort of draws you through the rest of the story. It's very, very well done, you know, the, the sort of structure shown at the beginning and then you know moving into actually the story itself and you forget you forget that this is a kind of um a document being written in prison well i have done a lot of judging particularly in the last two years uh, various literary prizes long fiction and and short stories and i mean the short story you can have discussions about the form and with the short story it's much easier for a piece of writing to fail than it is to succeed. So I think the, the lists often are obvious because so few people can write short stories well and that's, that's just the way of it. Um, and then what you're thinking about is sort of the pacing within the sort of metaphysics of it, whether it, whether it works as a kind of um, a, cl a classic piece that will be read and that's memorable and is doing, doing lots, perhaps being innovative within that form, which seems quite strict, but actually the short story can be very experimental. And when you find a writer who is uh, able to really move the walls, you know, absolutely wonderful. But I think for fiction and short stories, long fiction and short stories, um, the judging criteria is always how well has a writer achieved or fulfilled their own ambition for a book, whatever that ambition may be. So it's not really to do about what's a topical subject matter, whether this is more worthy in subject matter. Sometimes that can really work and chime with you as a reader. It's just more about what have they set out to achieve and have they done it? What's the vision for the book been and how wonderfully and radiantly has that been fulfilled? Mm. Um, and of course, every book dictates its own you know, merit that way. And it's incredibly hard. It's incredibly hard. I mean, you look at the shortlist of the folio this year, it's, the books are so very different, incredibly different in form and style. It's going to be in immensely hard to come up with a winner. Um, but what you hope as a judge is that you have created a shortlist or helped create a shortlist, which in itself is a kind of winning pattern of that year. And the winner is arbitrary in the end. I mean, it's, it's, there might be a clear winner or as they say, every book on the shortlist is a worthy winner. And that sometimes that's actually true and it's almost impossible. But you very rarely see a, pl a prize um, split between two writers. And I think that's a shame. Uh, I'm trying to finish a novel myself, so I'm not reading anything because I've been reading an awful lot lately. Uh, actually, that's a lie. The last thing I read was Train Dreams by Dennis Johnson, which is this amazing novella. Just brilliant. Um, and just a treat to read something short after having to read 80 novels. <laughs>